Hello, this is Professor Cummings. I wanted to do a short video just going over another aspect of strength of materials and design, which is just the concept of a stress element. Now, we spoke of, you know, some of the more basic types of stress in past videos. You know, in one case, we've got this Jeep, you know, this Jeep that's actually being propped up and sitting on top of these jacks. Over here on the, the right side, we have a hoist that's holding up a component from a ship and here we have a bolt that is holding two plates together now all stress has one basic concept in mind you've got a force or a load being applied to or over a cross-sectional area in the case of the hoist and the the Jeep you know the load is the Jeep and over here you got the load that is this component of the ship you know so it's providing this downward force you've got a reaction to that an internal resistance you know in in this case of the the jeep you know the jacks are actually in under a compressive load and giving you one type of stress and in this case this is under a tensile load and giving you another type of stress in the case of the bolt you know you're in a cross crossing across the face of the bolt so this is giving you a shearing uh, stress. So that's a compressive load, a shear load, and a tensile load. Now they all have, you know, the same, like I said, the same basic type of uh, a concept. Here I just have the idea of a, of a compressive or a tensile load, but a shearing load is the same idea. It's just a, a load over a cross-sectional area. Now, what about more complicated types of loads? We didn't really speak of that, but you know, you can have torsional loads. You can, have, which is also a type of a shear. And over here we've got a bending load. You know, they both add to stress. And in for the most part, you know, a lot of your mechanical design is not going to give you something as simple as one, you know, one dimensional type of a loading condition. You will have loads that come in different types of angles, different types of directions, you know, and so you're gonna end up with you know a variety of different loading conditions that you're gonna have to take into account for and design around in order to keep your end user and anyone else safe. So let's look at something where there's a, a easy to understand example and that would be a lathe. So that's all this is, the headstock of a lathe. And you see a four jaw chuck. You know this would be your essentially your gearing box, your drive shaft is inside of here. You've got the gearing at the end. You know it ties to a motor and this rotates you know hundreds and sometimes thousands of RPM and there's actually a lot of metal cutting taking place uh, from what is being gripped, usually a, you know some piece of metal, sometimes wood, uh, plastic, you know, being gripped inside of this chuck, and there's all sorts of cutting forces and forces just due to the weight of the chuck body as well as what it's holding up. So let's look at this idea and, and try and get an idea of what this type of stress is and how we would go about uh, analyzing it. So this is just a schematic of a chuck body, so you can see a, a, a lathe head. So you can see here you have the chuck, you know, you still have the chuck right over here. You've got, you know, the drive shaft here in the middle. You, you've got the housing, you know, being, you know, depicted here on the on the outside. So your drive shaft runs through the middle. You've got a couple of bearings holding it up at each end, a couple of taper bearings, and then you've got a lock nut on the end, you know, and a washer here that's being depicted. So when you think about this particular type of mechanical design, you know, offhand it sounds really easy. Lathes are, are usually pretty well known. We all understand what a lathe is. But think about the amount of loading and the different types of loading that's taken place. If we were drilling something on this lathe, you would actually have a load pressing in. So you've got a load going axially along the drive shaft. So that's one load to take into account. You've got the weight of whatever it is you're holding up. So you're going to have a bending load, you know, going in that direction. And you're also going to be spinning this. So as you cut in, come in with a tool to cut the material, you're going to have a tool load, and that tool load is going to have a reaction. So you're going to have a torsional load going around that shaft. So and there's probably other things besides just those that I've pointed out, but you can get the picture that this is a pretty complicated loading uh, loading application, what we're looking at here. This is actually a lot of different things are going on. So how would you go about designing to make sure that you have selected the right material, the right type of heat treat, 
or the right type of shaft diameter if you wanted to design a lathe. Well, you'd look at this combined stress, and that's what we are, are looking at, and you would take into account something called a stress element. Now, a stress element is just a tool, just a concept that we use when we're designing around combine, combined stresses, you know, more complicated stresses, and trying to understand what their different influences are and where the, the stress is in its maximum shear, where it's at its minimum principal stress, and we'll define these terms later, and the maximum principal stress. You know, and trying to get some idea as to how we need to adjust our design to accommodate all these influences in order for this machine to have a long and productive life. So what exactly is a stress element if we break it down into its nuts and bolts? It is an infinitesimally small representation of the stress. So what you can see here is we have this little box this little box and you do have the stress being depicted stress you know in one direction stress in another and you've got this shearing stress you know off here into the corner with you know different op equal and opposite reactions to it so it's an infinitesimally small representation of the stress that's taking place in the thing that you are actually designing it has an x, y, and sometimes z axis representation. Now, sometimes z meaning you can have a three-dimensional stress element or a two-dimensional stress element. Right now, I'm just going to discuss a two-dimensional stress element. And in either case, you you know the stress element has a coordinate uh, representation, as to, so you understand the directions that the stress is taking place in. Another issue, another point, is the orientation when you do use the concept of stress element. The orientation should be consistent with the actual element. So in other words, you have to define an x, y, and z axis. So in this case, you know, with this drive shaft, you could just say that would be the x axis, that would be the y axis going up and down. So an x, y, and z representation of it. Uh, and this, the orientation should be consistent with that. So when we put in our stress element, we want to make sure that, you know, what we're calling the x axis is represented by the x axis. Is represented by the x-axis on our stress element and that's where you see that sub x and that sub y and you know you can got the coordinate system here and the shear also has the xy coordinate system so we have to stay consistent with our xy coordinate system so that we know what we're talking about and just it's just a good practice of dealing with any kind of free body diagram and then last it can depict tension, compression, and a shear stress element. You can see in this diagram you've got a tension in both directions, but these arrows could also go inward. And if you're doing a compression, then the, the signs would change as far as being negative. But you can represent, you know, tension, compression, you know, in either one of these directions, as well as the shearing uh, stress element. And that's what this side portion is, is uh, representing. So just think of it as, you know, the load at the top and the bottom of the element, you know, forcing it in one direction and then you've got an equal and opposite reaction at the other side. So you've got a depiction of tension, compression, and shear stress element. And if we're going to use it and, and apply it to this diagram, to this schematic, you know, this is the way we'd do it. We'd actually take the stress element and show the point of interest that we're concerned with. You know, so in this case, I put the stress element just outside, just, just behind the chuck and just before the headstock, showing that, you know, I want to look at what the stress is going in this, in this one portion of it, where I think that this component is probably going to be the most vulnerable. So that is a stress element. Now, a stress element actually comes with six critical formulas that, that you need to understand. And it's actually, or, well, let me back that up. There's a, you know, three different types of stress elements that we're going to go into. And between these three different types of stress element, there's actually six critical formulas that I want you to be aware of. So the three different types of stress elements. Now, the first stress element was the one that we just looked at. It's just known as the original stress element. And it's just based on the applied normal stress and the shear stress. You know, so it's just a stress element where you have taken each one of the loads that you think you're going to have in your component and you have just depicted them together onto this little stress element. So you've got an X, Y, and Z, and these are all just your, your normal stresses and your shearing stresses as you look at them independently. 
so you've got your normal you know shear or excuse me your your normal stress is load over area your shear stress is load over area and it's just you know your most basic type of depiction of stress now your next stress element is a little more complicated because you want to look at the stress considering that it is a, a combined stress when it's going to be in the max shear so meaning that you've got the maximum amount of shear the net effect of it is all being depicted in this one stress element so it shows the average normal stresses and the shear stress at its highest magnitude so you got this shear stress where it's at its maximum and you got the average stress you know, the net effect of, of all the normal stresses acting out on it that comes to the to the average stress and this is the first formula that I wanted you to know so the first new formula is right here and that's just the average stress so this is the first formula I want you to look at so it is just the sum of the X and the Y stresses you know, whether they be in compression or tension divided by 2 and that gets us our average and our maximum shear stress you know, where the shear stress is actually giving us our worst case scenario it's just the difference between the X and Y stresses divided by 2 squared plus the shear stress as calculated above you know squared and then you know some summation of that and you take the square root and that lets us know what the maximum shear stress on that element is okay now now that we're considering this in shear you know it's not going to happen in this normal original state along the axis there will be some twisting you know where this worst case scenario shear is taking place and the way we depict that angle of twist of you know that angle that this is twisting through or the angle of max shear is what this is known for so it's phi sub t phi sub tau is equal to one half the arc tangent of the negative difference between x and y over two times the shear so everything goes back to these very basic very very basic uh, stresses so your normal stresses and your shear stresses are still at play in this equation so again let me number that one that was one and this one is two now we got a third type of stress which is your your principal uh, stress element now your principal stress element you're actually considering it you know it shows the maximum normal stresses along with an angle of inclination based on the shearing stress equaling zero so you have got the maximum shear stress and then as you rotate around you know where it actually goes down to zero this is going to tell us our maximum and minimum principal stresses now our maximum and minimum principal stresses can be depicted by this type of a concept I'm not going to call this the formula but this type of a concept which is just the average stress which we depicted or calculated above which we can calculate here the average stress plus or minus this maximum shear stress and that gives us two more formulas so we'll call these formulas 4 and 5 and we'll call this formula number 3 formulas 4 and 5 and all this is is again the average stress which is just, you know, we calculated that above, you know, plus the shearing stress, or excuse me, the maximum shearing stress, which we calculated here. And for the minimum, which is known as sigma sub 2, there's sigma sub 1 is maximum, sigma 2 is minimum. And this is just the average stress. Now it's minus the maximum shear. So plus the maximum shear, minus the maximum shear. So those are five of the equations. Now, along with this, you know, since we're going to where the shear stress is zero, that gives us another angle to look at and this is known as the angle of inclination you know and it's phi sub sigma you know based around the principal stresses and that is very similar so it's just one half the arc tangent of two times the max or two times the shearing stress over the difference between the x and y uh, normal stresses now once we know and this will be formula number six so once we know this, so once we've calculated these three elements, or these, you know, these three uh, original max, shear, and principal stress element, once we've calculated those three, and we understand these six formulas, we can now start considering the design that we need when, uh, you know, when performing any type of design.
Okay, this is Professor.